The NBC Theater presents... Screen Directors Guild Assignment, Production Stagecoach, Director John Ford, Stars John Wayne, Claire Trevor, Ward Bond. In early 1949, NBC found itself in the unfamiliar position as the nation's number two network. Amos and Andy and Jack Benny were now running back-to-back at 6.30 and 7 p.m. on Sunday nights for CBS. This is the Screen Directors Guild production of the United Artists motion picture classic, Stage Coach. Simultaneously, ABC's quiz show, Stop the Music, on for an hour at 8 p.m., had done tremendous damage to the ratings of NBC comedians Edgar Bergen and Fred Allen. Bergen took an extended break at the end of 1948, and Allen lost half his listening audience in a single month. Overnight, NBC's decade-long Sunday night ratings stronghold was over. Their first response was to launch the NBC Theater, later known as the Screen Directors Playhouse, on January 9th. We begin our story, here are a few words about the entertainment you will hear tonight and in future weeks at this time. The NBC Theater is proud to welcome the president of the Screen Directors Guild and the eminent director of such films as Variety Girl, The Perils of Pauline, and Tap Roots, Mr. George Marshall. Thank you, and good evening. This is the first performance of a series of Screen Directors Guild productions, in which the directors will personally bring you their favorite film assignments, along with the stars who created the original roles. Tonight, your director is John Ford. John, if you remember, is the winner of five Academy Awards, the guiding hand behind such great pictures as The Informer, How Green Was My Valley, and, of course, Stagecoach. You're on the set, John. Thank you, George. <clears throat> and good luck on our first production. Stagecoach is ready to roll. The last time I made that crack was about ten years ago. <laughs> and I first had the opportunity of putting on film this Romance of the West. For the cast, the picture offers an array of colorful character types, ripe for the actor's talents. Now the story and the cast are united again. Here is Stagecoach with John Wayne as the Ringo Kid. Claire Trevor as Dallas and Ward Bond as Doc Boone. In 1885, the stagecoach was the only means of travel on the American frontier. And in those days, no name struck more dread into the hearts of travelers than Geronimo, leader of the warlike Apaches. This, folks, is a story of a party of people who traveled from Tonto to Lordsburg by stagecoach in 1885. It's a story still told by the Indians. In the land of Arizona, land of the Apache Indian, where the roaming Chiricahua fought the mighty white invader, stood the white man's city, Tonto. Tonto, where the flying wagon that the white man called a stagecoach stopped to take men to the westward, where Geronimo was leader, chief of the Apache Indians. Well, that's how it is, folks. Geronimo's Apaches are on the war path up ahead, burning every ranch in sight. Oh. Then the question before the party assembled in this stagecoach is, shall we continue? I say yes. Continue. But, Mrs. Mallory, should you be traveling in your condition? My husband is in Apache Wells with his troops. I want to be with him when our baby arrives. Madam, I am a gambler, and I admire and respect a bold gamble. But aren't you gambling with a life besides your own? Oh, I forgot to tell you, Mr. Hatfield. We're getting a cavalry escort for Apache Wells. That settles it. I'm going on. 
Count me in, of course, Buck. All right. I'll go find my shotgun guard. You don't have to go no further, Buck. What? Curly! Well, <laughs> doggone! Now, how are you, Sheriff? Fine, thanks, and I'll be riding shotgun up next to you this trip, Buck. You? What for? The Ringo kid escaped from prison. I'm looking for him. The fellow who shot Jed Michael dead? I hear he's heading for Lordsburg to shoot it out with the three plumber boys, so I'll be right up there. The first episode featured an adaptation of Stagecoach, starring John Wayne, Claire Trevor, and Ward Bond. Dear Lord, this Stagecoach don't pass much for a church, but, but I'm praying to you here. Please, Lord... It's three to one against Ringo out there. And the plumber boys are dead shots. <laughs> Awful dead shots, Lord. <laughs> like I was saying, Lord, it's two to one, Lord. <laughs> He's all I got. And all I ever want. So please, dear Lord, please let me have him back. Please, please, please. <laughs> to anymore. Before he cashed in, Luke Plummer confessed he killed Jed Michael. You're, you're free? Yeah. And they didn't even hurt you? Dead shots like the Plummer boys? Deadest dead shots you ever saw. <gasps> oh, Ringo. Ringo. Dallas, what are you crying for? <laughs> Nothing's happened. <laughs> the story of those brave men, riders of the flying wagon, in the land of Arizona, where Geronimo was chief. In the great land in the desert where the flying wagon galloped, that the white men called the stagecoach, bringing brave men to the west. It was a valiant effort, but NBC had spent the previous years allowing their dramatic programming to atrophy. William Haley of CBS correctly understood that whether people turned on radios or TVs, the programming was what attracted them. NBC then focused their attention on developing new adult-oriented dramas. At their onset, many had a similar sound. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step... There was Dragnet, a tremendous police procedural, created by and starring Jack Webb. It premiered in the summer of 1949. And Nightbeat, a human interest series, with gripping stories that premiered in February of 1950. Night Beat. Hi, this is Randy Stone. I cover the night beat, the Chicago Star. You know, stories start many different ways. But this one began modestly enough with a zero on a typewriter. That's right, 
Cipher, not nothing. But to one man of Chicago's four million, that zero meant death. The adult science fiction series Dimension X took to the air in April. Adventures in time and space told in future tense. Dimension X. And the new western starred Hollywood A-lister Joel McRae. The show was bundled with five other programs, including Nightbeat, Dangerous Assignment, and Dimension X, and sold to Wheaties for their big parade in May of 1950, premiering on July 8th. Wheaties presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. On stage tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another in the Wheaties big parade of exciting half-hour presentations. of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Tales of the Texas Rangers dramatized real agency files. It brought the Western into the 20th century, covering a span of closed cases from 1928 to 1948. Small studio dramatic programs were seen as good deals for advertisers. Their cost per ratings point was much lower than orchestra or large variety shows. This episode of Pachi Peak from July 22, 1950, featured Sam Edwards and Byron Kane. Case for tonight, Apache Peak. Shortly after midnight on October 4 last, a late model blue sedan came to a stop at a traffic light on the highway leading southwest out of Wichita Falls, Texas. While the driver waited for the light to change, a figure moved out from the shadows and tapped on the window of the sedan. Going toward Haskell, mister? I didn't hear you with the window up. Said you're going near Haskell. I don't know. Where is it? I'm headed for El Paso. That's my direction. How about a ride? All right. Hop in. Thanks. Mighty hard getting a ride. As you like. Uh-huh. How far is uh, Haskell? About 80 miles. But I'm going past there up near Apache Peak. Ain't far from El Paso. Oh, good. Keep me from falling asleep at the wheel. I got to be in El Paso in the morning. Business appointment. You from the east? <laughs> New York. I guess the accent sticks out, huh? I reckon so. What kind of business you in? Salesman. Airplane parts. You get tired. I can drive a spell. Hey, that's a thought. As soon as I start to feel sleepy. Sure. Give you a chance to rest up. Good. <sighs> it's almost 4 a.m. Be in Odessa in 20 minutes. You want to take over? Yeah. Guess I can stop any place on this highway. Haven't seen another car in an hour. Hey, I'll slide over. You get out and come around. No, you get out. Well, it's just as easy for you. Hey. Hey, what are you doing with that gun? I need money, mister, and you got it. Oh, sure, sure. I'll give it to you. I won't report it or anything. I'll give... I know you won't, mister. Tales of the Texas Rangers will continue in just a moment. Tonight, as special guest, Wheaties champion Robert Feller. The series creator, Stacy Keach Sr., convinced the Texas Rangers that a radio show would provide good publicity. The organization had to approve each script. Keach and writer Joel Murcott got assistance from Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez, a 30-year man who killed 31 men in the line of duty. He served as technical advisor for the series. Chase Pearson relied on modern methods of crime detection. And Tales was first and foremost a Western detective show. You know, gentlemen of the audience, this man...
The star Joel McRae was an outdoorsman who owned a 3,000-acre spread in Ventura County, California. He spent the second half of his career appearing almost exclusively in westerns. Wheaties, breakfast of champions. Get yours. And now, back to our story with Joel McRae as Ranger Pearson. The body was discovered at 8.15 on the morning of October 4 when a fence rider from a ranch bordering the highway found it in the brush at the side of the road. He reported the discovery to the nearest sheriff, and the sheriff relayed the report to the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case. There's the body, Jace, under that sheet. Where was he found, Sheriff? Oh, about 11 mile east. Must have been dumped out of a car. Hmm. Shot three times. One through the neck and two through the chest. Thirty-eight caliber? Yeah. Coroner got two of the slugs. Any identification on him? Or on a thing, Jace. Whoever done it even stole the clothes off of him. Except in his shirt and shorts and necktie. And a pack of cigarettes from his shirt pocket. It's all there on the table. Hmm. Laundry mark on the shirt. That might help. Coroner, say how long he's been dead? Oh, since four or five o'clock this morning. Hmm. These cigarettes, were they on him? Yeah. Why? They help any? Maybe a whole lot. Look at this. New York State tax stamp. Uh, can you make something out of that? Only the one pack of cigarettes wouldn't have lasted him from New York to Texas. Probably bought a carton or two to start out on a trip. So his home might be in New York. I reckon an awful lot of folks buy a carton of smokes in New York, Chase. Yeah, but it's a place to start checking that laundry mark on the shirt. It'll be a help if we know who this man is. I'll send these things into the lab, and they can send a wire photo of the mark to New York. The coroner has some pictures of the body. We'll put them on the wire, too. You got a deputy to get the stuff to my headquarters? Sure thing. I'll call him. Good. Then we can get out and check the scene. Herb Ellis and Herb Vigrant often appeared in character parts. Last week, did you guys play uh, Tales of the Texas Rangers? Was I the partner to Jay's? What was my name? <laughs> no. What was my name in the show? Well, I played oh, his was partner. Was him? Because I, I, I listened uh, what, to him. Well, who was his partner? Harley Bear was the sheriff? Harley was on. Oh, well, then maybe that particular Jerry show... Jerry Hausner done. was on it, too, I think. Yeah. Maybe that yeah. particular part. But I, I remember doing many, many episodes as his partner and being featured. Uh, and by the way, that was... Yes. That's who I was, Clay Morgan. Thank you. And that show was produced by Stacy Keats, the father of Stacy Keats, the actor. And... Dwarf Oak here. Flash your light. Yeah, that's it. Hold it. Anything? Yeah. Branch bent. It's been brushed. Look here, been nibbled a bit, too. Recent. Torn leaves are still fresh. Well, we're headed right, then. Must have gone straight ahead between those big rocks. Yeah. Yeah, this is it, all right. Look at the side of the rock. Flex the mic peeled off. Little fiber stuff. Burrow pack ropes must have scraped it. Let's keep going. The oaks and cedars fought for whatever slight grip their roots could get on the earth between the rocks. Dawn found us on a high shelf facing a rise that led to the open mouth of an abandoned silver mine. Trey leads straight enough now. Yeah. He's there, Chase. Yeah, but 20 feet back in. He could pick us off and we'd never even get to see him. Stay down and keep the hole covered. What are you going to do? Just call him out. Tripper! Lanny Tripper. He ain't gonna answer, Chase. You can't get out, Tripper. <coughs> Stay down, Chase. Now he's got a rifle as well as that 38 he killed Bradley with. You gonna come out, Tripper? Why don't you come in, Ranger? <coughs> if we'd only packed a stick of dynamite, he'd come out soon enough or be buried in there. Maybe the idea of dynamite would be enough. 
Go over down the shelf and let him see you just once on the way. Not long enough to draw a bead. Maybe we can bluff him. Why don't you go down and let me... It's my idea. I'll stay. Go ahead. Be careful, Jace. <laughs> you missed him, Tripper! I won't miss the next one! You're not gonna get another shot! He went down to our burrows to get some dynamite. We're gonna seal you in there, Tripper. You better come out. How do I know you ain't gonna kill me on sight? I won't if you do what I tell you. Leave your rifle in there and come out with your hands clasped behind your head. Put your rifle up on a rock where I can see it and it's a deal. All right, Tripper. Now come out. He came out of the shaft slowly, first a blur, then into the light with his hands behind his head. I got up and he walked toward me. He wasn't wearing a gun belt, but there was something in the way he moved that made me keep my hands close to my holsters. Then he made a quick sidestep and his hands came from behind his head and I caught the glint of a thirty-eight. <laughs> I'm all right. Get a man. Gun hand and arm. Put a tourniquet on and we'll take him down. What's the matter with you, Jace? You look kind of funny. Just thinking of his folks down there. His mother and even the old man. Just trying to help him because he belongs to them in spite of everything he's done. Now, folks are like that. We got to bring him in and break their hearts. Yeah. Makes you wonder why he ever wanted to wear a badge. Until you remember the man he killed and the three kids who'll have to grow up without him. That makes you know you couldn't ever want to do anything but wear a badge. Uh, there's a tourniquet. That'll hold him. All right, Tripper, on your feet. Let's go. At the end of each episode, McCray would return with a bit of Ranger lore. And the announcer gave the results of the case. A ballistic check of the 38 that Lenny Tripper carried showed it to be the murder weapon used in the slaying of Roger Bradley. With that and other evidence accumulated by Ranger Pearson and the department, Tripper was convicted and sentenced to death in the electric chair. It was also in 1950 that NBC appointed advertising executive Sylvester Pat Weaver as president. He quickly expanded over a dozen NBC radio shows for TV. Frank. Television revenue jumped 190% for the year. But Wheaties pulled the plug on the entire big parade after just eight weeks. Sorry, we're fresh out. Why, that's no mystery. NBC moved the program to Sunday afternoons after the October 8th episode. With the increasing competition from television, radio shows without sponsorship were doomed. I think you hit it, Frank. By the middle of 1950, more than 10,000 U.S. homes were turning on TVs each week. Radio ratings fell by 30% to their lowest since 1936, and radio budgets were being siphoned into television production. Joel McRae was working for less than he usually received for film work, but the series ended after two years. Joel McRae will soon be seen in the MGM production Stars in My Crown. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Bill Johnstone, Sam Edwards, Paul Duboff, Byron Kane, and Virginia Gregg. The last episode of Tales of the Texas Rangers aired on September 14, 1952. The series moved into television in 1955, starring Willard Parker and Harry Lauder. Tomorrow, listen for Dorothy Maynard. Now it's Basin Street on NBC. And NBC was never again radio's most popular network.